2018 is kind of coming to an end, and I can't believe that it's 2018. It just like blows my brains. Um, but time is certainly flying. You know, I, I've come to realize that 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 time moves very, very slowly. Like the days move slow, but time is racing. Right? I mean, didn't today? Who believes that today seemed like a long day? Raise your hand. Anybody? A long day? Only two of us. I want to know what your program is, man. What's up? That's a long day then, right? Whew, man. My, my wife's cousin, Wendy, she said online just a little bit ago, her, her, her youngest daughter is graduating college tomorrow. She said, I blinked and time went by. Where did my babies go? And I replied, I said, I've been, I wink all the time and my kid's only five. I don't understand this. It's not flying by fast enough. I love my little boy, Jackson. He's cool. But I've, I've been reflecting a lot. I don't know if you guys have been on on your year, and um, you know, my year is always like intertwined with the year that Revolution Church had. Whatever year you guys had, I had that same year, and I was, I was very thankful for the year. I was thinking back from the people that had um, come forward and said yes to Jesus, and, and uh, you know, they got baptized, and I'm seeing a lot more now. Something very different in our church than we've had in the past, where I see a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentoring and discipling relationships begin to blossom. And that's just super exciting for me. Uh, I know that uh, myself and all pastors and all people in churches, you know, they want their church to, to grow, and, and I do too. But before it grows out there, it has to grow here. And so to see people uh, walking up to someone and saying, hey, would you disciple me? And that person saying yes and seeing walking in here, several times during the week and seeing a one-on-one -on -one going on there. I mean, that just excites my soul, and I hope it excites you, too. It's been a great year, and God has brought some wonderful people into our lives, and we've seen God provide uh, in amazing ways, and so we're thankful for that. The latest I shared here on Wednesday night, I share, if you weren't here, who wasn't here Wednesday night? This is to shame you. Okay, awesome. You just fell for it. Um, so on, on Wednesday night, I share with the church, I'll share with you now, and... Um, I'm pretty excited about it, and we're going to talk about prayer tonight. I'm not going to hide that. We're going to talk totally about prayer tonight. But one of the things that we've been praying about pretty consistently for some time now is about this sound system. So it sounds pretty decent right now, but as you know, if you've been coming for a while, there's just always this steady buzz and crackling, and the microphones don't work. And I'm not talking about when this, the pastor's a slacker and doesn't turn them on. I'm talking about when they're on and they still don't work. You guys have been there lots of times when you see me walk over here and touch the pulpit and all of a sudden it goes, <laughs> and I feel like I'm going to get like electrocuted. Like there's all these problems, right? And so um, I'm just happy to tell you that um, we've been praying and I shared it with you from the pulpit about this issue. And, you know, this stuff's expensive and, and I understand that we don't have millions of dollars in the bank. And so what do you do when you have a great need that you just can't accomplish on your own? You pray, right? And so we began to pray about this. And I just want to, so I'm just going to let the cat out of the bag. I'm just going to let you know exactly what's going on. So when we, um, when our old worship leader, Kyle, was here about a month or so ago, him and his wife, Jamie, I know you know who they are, and you do, right? So, but other than y'all, so um, that's his mom and dad. So, um, <laughs> so when he was here, he, he, we had a full band, you know, and it was really awesome, and it was a great night of worship, and we enjoyed it. I, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Carl, you're killing me. I love you. You're, I love you. See, be careful when you have a, a Christmas party at your house because you never know what kind of freaks show up. <laughs> and um, so anyway, um, his, his costume right now is almost what won him the award last night. Like, that's how crazy he is. But um, so anyway, so when, he was, when, he was, when they were here, like, we were having a hard time utilizing what we have with the people that we had. And so, you know, we've also been praying that God would send us a quality worship band with the right heart and the right gifting. We've all prayed for that several times, like on Monday night. Like, and so we're waiting, right? So when Kyle was here, we're trying to patch this pig to make it work. And it was just all kinds of problems, right up to the last minute. We still had a massive buzz going through everything. And, the, and what he saw is, is what we all know. It's the same equipment that we had when he and I started this church. It's the same old junk. And he was like, man, this is just ridiculous. So he went back to his church up in Chicago. It's called the Chapel. And they have 15,000 people that attend their church. And he just wrote an email to the senior pastor and said, listen, the church that I, I started in, the church that I met the Lord at, the church that I started serving in, they're, 
they're a great church, they're wonderful people, and they're just struggling. They get, their sound system is more of a distraction than it is a benefit. Do you think that we could just buy them a whole new sound system? And they said yes. <laughs> it was crazy, man. They said yes. So they're, they're buying us a brand new digital board and a brand new, all the wiring that you need to get from there to here so you can hear it. And they're paying for Kyle to come down here to install it all. And so he is coming. And then his wife, Jamie, is coming. And, and Jamie's dad, Rick, who's an expert in sound and lighting, like one of the best there is in the world, he's coming the same week, too. And they're going to rip all this junk out of here. And they're going to install a brand new sound system into our church. So yeah, God is so good, right? This is what happens when you pray, OK? Yeah, anybody needs something like that? And maybe not a sound system, but do you need something big in your life to happen? Anybody? Raise your hand if you're looking for something big. OK, awesome. So I'm speaking to everybody tonight here. Well, that's just one of the things that has happened in, in our year. And I'm excited about what God is doing in our church. I'm excited about the future. I'm looking forward to 2019. And um, I want to take a, a few minutes to, to start out. I want to talk about something that, that really is the philosophy of our, of our church. It's, it, it's what guides us as a ministry. It's why we do what we do. And, and it really has a lot to do with prayer. But it's, it's this word vertical. Now, if you've, come, you've, uh, if you've been coming at all, you hear that word a lot around here. You see the, the logo on the screen. You hear it's spoken of from up in the pulpit. If you come on Wednesday night, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you are not familiar with that, I want to take a few moments and I want to talk about this vertical philosophy toward life as an individual, just you, just Matt, right, just Jessica, but then also corporately together as a church, as a ministry. What vertical really means at its core is that we, we understand that every, all of our answers come from above, right? I, like, I, I can ask you some advice and stuff, and that could be, good, but ultimately all of our answers come from above, all of our provision comes from above, all of our joy, all of our purpose, all of our fulfillment, all of our wisdom, all of our gifts, all our identity, right, all of that, every bit of help is from above. It comes down from heaven to us. You guys understand, right? This way, up and down. Now, in response to this coming down, we would offer all praise and all glory and all honor and all worship and all thanksgiving. Everything in response goes up, okay? Everything from God comes down to us, and in response, we go back with our praise and our worship and our thanksgiving and our service. Everything goes up. This right here, this vertical relationship is most vital to human flourishing, both personally, just you, and then corporately, as a church. The Bible would say it this way about the church. Ephesians uh, 3.21 would say, glory to him, glory to God in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations. So it's not like when the church started it was all about Jesus, but then now it's more about social issues. Now it's more about helping the, the homeless and the helpless and the, no, 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 no. All glory to God in the church for all generations, right? That's what this is all about. So here we understand that the church is unchanging and that it's always to God, through God, for God, and to the glory of God. That is the reason why this church exists and that guides and directs every single thing that we do. Everything, okay? Our gatherings, our, what we would spend our money on, what we, who we would spend time with, whatever events we're going to do, it's all for that and that alone. And if our church, or any really for that matter, if any of us want to experience the presence and the power of the Holy One who died for his church, who loves his church, who's building his church, if we want to experience him, then a vertical perspective and a philosophy must be practiced all the time. Unchanging. It never will change. That's what this church is all about. That's the sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. 
Because if you go to other churches, and I'm not ripping on any of them, there's great churches in this world. But oftentimes you go to church, you'll go to a service, and you don't even, it's 30 minutes before the name of Jesus comes up. And we're talking about programs and events and give me all your money and all these different things. I'm not ripping anyone. I'm just saying it just doesn't seem like the focus is on the Lord. It's just not. Sometimes it's on an awesome communicator. And he's more famous than the church itself. I could name you some pastors right now. And you'd go, oh, I know who they are. And I would challenge you to tell me the church, the name of the church they pastor. Most people can't. And that's the problem with some of the churches. And and our endeavor here is to always stay focused on the main thing, and that is on God himself. And so this vertical perspective kind of gets fleshed out. First of all, I didn't come up with this stuff, okay? I just heard it, and it rocked my world, and I was like, oh, my gosh, that's it. That's the Bible in a nutshell, and so we're going to do this. It fleshes out corporately in the church setting in four different ways. These are four things that together as a gathering of people— we, we cannot neglect these four things. One is unapologetic preaching of God's word. The second is the unashamed adoration of God's son. The third is the unceasing prayer of God's people. And the fourth is the unafraid witness, Philip say amen, of God's people. Listen. God, Almighty God, is totally into all four of these things. These are his big ones right here, okay? And and when these things are being done consistently and earnestly, consistently, all the time, it invokes God's presence, and therefore, wherever his presence is, what else is there? His power. And in that context right there, that's when God can do his best work. He can build his church. He can advance his kingdom when his presence and his power is there. That right there, all four of those things, those are the things that are needed for Jesus Christ to come and do his mightiest work. And that's what we're going to do. Now, i got to ask you a question. Do you think that any of those things can be neglected? I think that you could probably have a, I mean, could you have a decent church if you didn't, I mean, if you really weren't strong in music, could you have a decent church? Could you... Could, could you have a decent church if, you, if, if the people weren't necessarily doing what the Bible said all the time? Could you have a decent church? I would say yes, if you're willing to forego God's best for your church and for the community that he planted you in. If you're willing to see less salvation... If you're willing to see less wet floors around the tank, if you're willing to see less life transformation, if you're willing to see less healing of body and soul and spirit and mind, if you're willing to see that, if you're willing to to, to forego the, 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 the maximum amount of gospel penetration into your community, if you're willing to see less of that, then yeah, you can blow some of that stuff off. I'm not into that. Never has been, never will be. Okay, so that's the church that you're in. I will never relent. I will never step down off of those four things ever until I'm dead. Okay, so that's the church that you're sitting in. And I'll push and push there. Now listen, I want to spend a few moments kind of unpacking these four things so you can understand what they are. Okay. So let's start with the first one, and I get super excited about this because I'm a preacher. So let's talk about the unapologetic preaching of God's word, okay? This is, we're talking about the veracity of Scripture. That means, is it true? Is it fact? Well, the Bible says of itself that all of Scripture, every single word of it, who's got your Bible? You have your Bible? Hold up your Bible if you have your Bible. That's so awesome. A church filled with people with Bibles. That is awesome, right? So, so we're talk, this, is, this is what the Bible says about itself. God says this. He says, All of this, all of Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us. All of it, right? So how much of it should we miss? None, right? All of it is inspired by God and useful to teach us the truth. And listen, it goes on to say that God uses it. It, what is it? Right, the Word. God uses it to prepare all of his people for every good work. So anything that would, would be... a if there's a result of your salvation, 
any result from your salvation would be inspired by this. Anything that would come from your life and your new life in Christ, it's going to come because you heard this, right? Not, not any other reason. Not because I can tell you funny stories and funny jokes and we can have a cool place. and all, not, not, look, The word of God has the power to change a life. So we don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about all other things. You need to get to a church that says stuff like, open your Bible too, right? And we say that every single week here. Every single week. Every time we gather, it's open your Bible too. And this is not just because I like to preach. It's because the Bible says in... in uh, 2 Timothy 4.2, Paul says to his young protege, Timothy, who he's training up to be a pastor, he said, I plead with you in the presence of God to preach the word. And when you get together with your people, right, preach the word, whether it's in season or out, like whether you want to or not, whether they want to hear it or not, preach the word. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. What kind of teaching? The word, right? He said, preach the word. Don't tell funny limericks and jokes and riddles and, and stories about your kids and puppy dogs and the Red Sox. Nobody cares about that stuff. It doesn't help anybody. So we preach the word all the time. So that being said, should we, uh, should we pretty it up? I mean, you go to Hollywood, right, before they get out there on the stage and they, or, or, or Broadway and they... You know, they put powder on their faces and make them look prettier so that people will like it more and they'll want to come and buy more tickets. And, right, that's what they do. Should we, should we pretty it up so that, so that people will like the Word of God? Who, nobody likes the Word of God. It, it rubs us wrong. It goes against our grain and everything. You can't hardly open up the book to any paragraph, any page, any topic and read something that you like. So why would we want to make it pretty? Should we, should we water it? Should we take that steak and put it in a juicer and, and pour some water in there and grind it up and make it a, 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 a meat milkshake so that it's easier to swallow? No, no. You get the meat of the word. The meat of the word is the stuff that you can't swallow easy. It doesn't mean it's good or bad. It's just tough to take. So we're not supposed to pretty it up. We're not supposed to water. Maybe we could skip some spots because, you know, this is 2018 and I don't want to offend you, man. And I don't want to hurt your feelings. Have you ever even met Jesus Christ? Have you met this dude who went up to the leaders and called them sons of vipers and dead men's bones? Right? Got ticked off in the temple, started cracking whips. Straight up. Straight up. So, the answer to all this thing, should we pretty it up? Should we water it down? Should we skip some places so we don't offend anybody? What's the answer to that? No, no absolutely not. And that makes me happy because that's what I do. So I'm happy to be in the right church. Thank you. So when we gather, we preach, right? Check mark. We do that. That's what we're supposed to do. We, we preach. How about the second thing here? Unashamed adoration. What does that all mean? Unashamed adoration of God's Son. Jesus Christ is the focal point of the church. He started the church. He's building the church. He's the pastor of the church. He's who we worship in the church. All glory to him in the church for every generation. Amen, right? That's what it says. And so what are we supposed to do when we get together? Are we supposed to sing songs to Jesus? Yeah. We're supposed to sing songs when we get together. Um, <clears throat> but vertical worship is not the same as the worship you may be used to. See, vertical worship means we don't sing songs so much about us. And we don't sing songs so much about even what God has done for us. Although there's a place for that and a time for that. But vertical worship means that we're supposed to sing songs about him to him. To him, right? How would we do this? What should our, do you ever wonder, what should our worship be like? I mean, go to church to church, we... Should it be loud? Should it be quiet? Should it be hymns? Should it be, should it be contemporary? Should it be big? Should it, we, had a, we had a big song, right? And then we had two, two uh, this guy Kyle and his wife, I think her name is Abby or something, 
They were sitting in a warehouse. That was kind of simple, right? And then we went big again. Like, what's the right way? I don't know. Well, let me just, let's see what it says in Scripture. No, there's a right way. There's a right, very right way. Luke 9.20, Jesus said that if you're ashamed of me and my words, then I will be ashamed of that person when I come to return in glory. So, so what should our, now keeping that in mind, just keeping that in mind, right? What does your worship, what should your worship look like? Should you be all timid in your chair? I don't want anybody to see me. I'm unashamed. Woo! Dance and sing in Jesus. Woo! Like, that's what he wants to see. Not unashamed of, of, of letting Jesus be your, your Savior and your Lord. Like, I'm excited about that, right? So passionate. Passionate. How about this? Um, Psalm 95 says this. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing songs of praise to him. Psalm 96. Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Psalm 66.1. Shout joyful praises to God, all the earth. I don't know about you, but I think there's definitely a way that God wants to be praised. I think there's a way that God wants to be worshipped. I think that, that, that the volume says so. He doesn't say, shout to the Lord, all the earth, because he doesn't want you to. Right? I mean, do we get to pick and choose? What does it say? So is there a right way? There's a right way. It's described in Scripture. That's what he's telling us. I want you to, to shout it out to me. So when you worship, it should be loud, it should be passionate, it should be unhindered, and it should be directed where? Vertical. To him. We don't sing songs about, uh, we were made to thrive. Who cares what you were made for? Are you in here worshiping you? Who are we in here worshiping? We should be singing to him, you are awesome, you are holy, 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 you are worthy, you are beautiful, you are powerful, you are Lord, you are king, you are savior, you are mighty. That's what we should be doing. That's what it says. And we should be unashamed to do it before people, okay? So when you get together in a vertical church, unashamed adoration of God's son, okay? So I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, in the weeks to come, we're going to see a little bit of this going on up in here, right? little Jesus party going up in here. I think that's what he wants. He says it in his word, right? Come on now. Unashamed adoration. Are you like so focused that you can't get excited? <clears throat> Anybody feel like just screaming like a crazy loon the name of Jesus? Nobody? Come on, somebody scream the name of Jesus. Come on, Philip. Jesus! I love Jesus, right? Unashamed. I love Jesus Christ. That's what worship is. Unhindered, passionate. Get after that thing. That's what he wants from his people. Shout joyful praises to God all the earth. What would that sound like? If everyone on earth was shouting joyful praises to the Lord all at one time, it would shake the earth, right? He didn't write it in there because it sounds cool. He's, he wrote in there because that's what he wants. So why don't we lead the way, Revolution Church, and let's be that kind of church every single time we come in here, rock the concrete with his praises. Can we do that? I'm going to remind you of it next week. Christmas is coming. Okay, so when we gather, un listen, unapologetic preaching of God's word, check. Unashamed adoration of God's son in worship, check. So I'm going to skip one. I'm going to go to this unafraid witness. And so I was like, going to like start looking up theology and that and, and teaching about that. And, I, and it dawned on me, it's like, do you really need to have a, a chapter and a verse that tells you you should do what the Bible says? I mean, do you, real, do you guys really need that, right? We don't need that, right? The Bible, you, you know that he says. There's like, it's filled with do this and don't do that. I mean, you know this, right? It says to live a life worthy of your calling. So we don't need a whole lot of teaching to teach you to... Open it, read it, and do it, right? Everybody in here, do you guys, do you know, I mean, just, I just want to make sure for clarity, you all know that what it says you're supposed to do, right? 
Okay, so we don't need to like teach a whole lot about that. It's pretty obvious when he tells you to do something. If he's the Lord, you're supposed to obey it, right? That's pretty obvious. Okay, so that being said, of all the four vertical expressions, only one on the list clearly states that it shall be done in the house of the gathering. In, and so much so that it would actually become the identification mark, what it would be called. That this thing, I'm not talking about at your house or in your deer stand or in your car or at the hockey rink or whatever. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about right here. There's only one thing on this list of the four that is, it's called this thing. Like, and we're supposed to do it so much in the gathering, in the house, that it, it becomes the identification mark for the house, okay? Three times in Scripture, so it's repeated. Three times, this is a big deal. In Isaiah 56, 7, Matthew 21, 13, and Mark eleven seventeen, they all say the same thing. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. That's what it says in the Scriptures about this thing that we call church buildings. My house... Whose house is this? It's God's house, right? And, and, and my house shall be called a house of prayer. So listen, listen up. Should you pray at work? Should you pray in your car? Should you pray in the shower? Should you pray when you get up in the morning? Should you pray when you go to bed at night? All the time you should be praying. And, but, but was this place ever called a house of preaching? How about a house of singing? No, it's, it shall be called a house of prayer. Now, Revolution Church, we, listen, we preach God's word. We, we sing God's praises. But what about this clear command that we see right here? It shall. Is that, how much wiggle room is there? None. It shall be called a house of prayer. Now, what that means is, the assumption that God's making, to call it that, what? You must be doing that. Right? He's not going to say, hey, this is, a, uh, this is a country club if it's not. Right? He's not gonna, no one's going to say, hey, this is an awesome pet store. Because it's not. No one's going to think that this is Home Depot. Because we don't have the stuff they have. Right? So if this is going to be called, if it shall be, if, his, if, his, if God's desire is to call this thing called Revolution Church a house of prayer, then um, what do we need to do? Pray. We need to pray, man. And listen, I have to admit something. In our whole week, in our whole week, on Monday nights from 7 to 8, we started this thing like, man, we got to pray, we got to pray. So we started a prayer meeting, 7 to 8 on Monday nights. That's good, right? We should do that. Don't you think we should do that? Who thinks we should do that? It's a great idea. Awesome. So it means you'll probably all be here this week, right? 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 Yes. So listen, think about this though, right? Most churches in America, they don't even have a prayer night anymore. Did you know that? No. No, they don't. Listen, I've never been to a church that had a prayer night, ever, till we started one. I've heard of churches having them. But I don't hear about them anymore. Let me ask you a question. Does your church have one back home? A prayer night every week? Once a year. How many people go to that church? I'm not ripping it. We're not saying the name. Okay. Once a year. Once a year. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Once a year. And then for us, listen, we, we think we're all superheroes, right? Once a week. One hour a week. No, I'm not talking about who gets together on Saturday morning before the crack of dawn and comes for intercessory prayer. I'm talking about the corporate prayer when everyone in the church gathers just to do that. One hour a week. Epic failure. That's my fault. It's not your fault. It's my fault. I'll take the responsibility. I think it's a great start. I think we initiate. It's been for two years now we've been doing it on Monday nights, every Monday, something like that. It's good. But is, does that constitute a house of prayer? No, not, not at all. Not at all. So my question to you is, as a church family, because I'm not the church, we're the church, 
Do you want to do better than that? Yes. That was not a very, yes. yeah, I don't even, yeah, I'm not quite sure that they really want to, right? I kind of like it the way we are. I like lazy. That's me. I want to do lazy. Do you want to do lazy? I want to do better. Does anyone want to do better? Yes. Okay, I want to do better. So let's start the process. We can't, we can't start the process of getting better until we know what we're supposed to do and how we're going to get there. Okay, so let's start the process here tonight. So if you've been here at all, then you know that several times, like many times, I have discussed with you and taught pretty clearly and extensively on the biblical mandate for you know, for prayer. Um, 1 Timothy 2.1, pray for all people. You know that, right? We're supposed to pray for all people. Philippians 4.6, pray about everything. And then 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. So the biblical mandate is pray for all people, for all things, at all times, right? That's, that's a big high watermark, but that's what God's word says it's just as valid as thou shalt not kill. It's just as valid as thou shalt have no other idols before me. If it's in his word, God uses it to teach us where we're right and wrong and to equip us to do every good work. So when he says, I want you to pray for all people, for everything, and without ceasing, does he want us to do it? Yeah. But are we? Yeah. No. We're not. But here's the thing. We all in this room, I know I speak for all of you, we all want all great stuff from God. We all want the vertical stuff coming down, right? We all want this. We all want the good and perfect gifts that come from above. We all want it. We want to see our families blessed, our churches blessed, our business blessed, our marriages blessed, our kids are blessed, our nation is blessed. We want all that, but yet he says how to get it, and we don't do it. But we need to change that here. We need to change that here in our church. But here's the thing. I don't think, just like the last couple weeks, I don't think anyone, hardly, I'll say, well, hardly, hardly anyone is that radically obedient that they're just going to hear the preacher say it, quote the verse, and go, okay, I'm going to do it from now on. I, I just, it just doesn't happen that way. Sometimes it does. You get that, that guy or gal that's just like, the, the, the switch is flicked, and they just totally change. Like, I get that. But most of the time, it doesn't happen that way. So remember a few weeks ago I said, close your eyes for a moment and visualize. What would this church be if we all went all in? Remember when we did that? And we had that moment of, like, what would it be like if we all served the way we should and how we all give the way we should and the way we all pray the way we should and if we all studied and meditated on God's word as we should. And we had all this vision in our mind of what could be. Is this church all it could be? And everyone said, no, it's not. But what would it be if we did all of that? Well, I want to kind of do that same thing again. You don't have to close your eyes. But I'll just say this. I think the reason why you don't pray and the reason why I don't pray is because I don't think that we understand the benefits. You know, we're told, pray for all people, pray for everything, and don't stop praying. Awesome. I, but if you, we're all humans. We're on the same level here. If you don't, recognize what it's going to do for you, you're not going to do it. We just don't, right? You just don't. When you go to, a, I mean, I sold cars. You, sold, you go to the dealership, and you want to see, wh what are the features of this car? How is this thing going to benefit me? Like, I, it's a nice car. It's pretty. I can afford it. But how is this thing going to benefit me? Why, why should I join the, the family at Revolution? Like, what, what's the benefit for me? I mean, we're all hedonists. That's the way God created us, to, to, to please ourselves. So we have to understand, when he says pray, okay, God, I'd love to pray, but could you please tell me why I should? Because radical obedience ain't cutting it. I never did it when my parents told me what to do. I didn't do it when my teachers told me what to do. I didn't do it when the preacher told me what to do. So God, you're going to need to tell me what to do. That's all of us, right? We're all in this. So let's talk about the benefits of, the, of this thing, right? You get a job, you know you got to go to work because if you don't, you get fired, right? That's, but what makes the job tolerable and good is when you recognize the benefits from it. I, oh, so I don't just go to work. You actually pay me this, and, and my insurance is this, and I get vacation time, and I get this, and profit sharing, and 401s, and all these different. So it makes the job better. Like, you know you have to go to work to eat, but when you start to recognize and realize the benefits of the job, you know, the bennies, that's when it makes it worthwhile and it makes you want to go to work. Not just because you have to, but because you want to receive the benefits that are promised. 
So let's take a look at some of these benefits here in Scripture. And then, again, I'm not going to hide it. I'm gonna, we're going to spend some time. We're going to pray. We're going to take these things that we're reading, and we're going to actually do them, okay? You ready to do that? All right, so do me a favor. Go to James chapter 4. Go to James chapter 4, and let's just read the first three verses right there. Just kind of holler out when you're there. I see some people still looking. I don't want to lose anybody. James is towards the back of the Bible, one of the last few books in the Bible. It's after the very large book of Hebrews, before Peter, first and second. Okay? So this is what it says. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires that war within you? So you can see there's like problem with, you know, between people. And then you can see right there like this issue is going on inside of you personally. You've got evil desires at war within you. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. I just, just think about that for a second. Like, so you got issues... You just got stuff going on, right? So, so there's, there's, there's quarrel, there's, there's, there's issue between people. Then you got some internal stuff, because all of us do that, right? We got some desires and, some, and some, we have evil desires that we're trying, we give into sometimes. And then we kind of know what we should be doing, but we don't. It was that whole thing that Paul talked about in Romans 7. Like, I know the thing I should do, but I don't. And I know the things that I shouldn't do, but I do them. And who can help me from this, this awful life of sin and death? But Jesus, right? So you recognize that, and we all have that issue right here too, and so that's why we're supposed to be praying. we got these issues, and then it talks about being jealous of things that you want, and jealousy is not of God. We shouldn't covet things that are not ours. We could want some good things, but we shouldn't be jealous of this, that, and all of us are prone to do that. And so what do we do here? It says uh, we scheme and kill. We fight and wage war. Well, you know, I would just say that we have stuff that we'd like to see happen in our life. We have evil desires versus holy ones. We've got problems and issues and circumstances. And we have stresses and fears and worries and anxieties and doubts. I just got a bunch of questions, God. I got life going on over here, right? That's what's going on here. And, and James is addressing it. We got stuff going on in our life that we'd like to see happen. I got bad motives, I got bad processes. So I got bad processes. We got stuff that's, that's bothering me, but look what they say. It says, but then, uh, because you got this stuff, you scheme and kill, um, you fight and wage war. Well, none of us in this room, I think, are scheming and killing. I don't think any of us are rounding up a posse and going to shoot up somebody's house. But I will say that this speaks pretty loudly about when we have stuff in our life, we have bad processes in order to deal with them and, and, and accomplish things. And we're all guilty of that. I got all this stuff going on in my life, and so let's make a plan. You know, uh, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I need some more money, so I'm going to work some more. I know it neglects my family. My wife will forget me. My husband doesn't know who I am. My kids don't, they're being raised by someone else, but I'm going to work some more, and so I'm Maybe I'll cut some corners, and maybe I'll relax some convictions or ignore some morals. I just little, they're just little white lies. It's not that big of a deal, right? And God's like, whoa, whoa, boy. Listen, what are you doing, man? You got this stuff on, going on in your life. I understand that. Some, some relational problems, some, some lusting and jealousy problems. You got some issues going on inside of you, and you're going about fixing these things in the wrong way. So um, you have not, because look what it says there in the text. Yeah, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. You have not because you ask not. That's the problem. Bad process. I'm the one with glorious unlimited resources, God says. I'm the giver of good gifts to my children who ask, Matthew 7, 11. I'm the one who rewards those who earnestly seek me, Hebrews 
11.6. This is who God the Father is. He's a loving Father who wants to give out good gifts to his children if they'll ask him. But oftentimes, asking him for stuff is diminished to our last resort. When our plan fails, then what do we do? Well, that's all we can do now is pray. Wait a minute. The, the, the sovereign king of the universe who has glorious, unlimited resources, you forgot to ask him? Why are you asking me for money? I have none. Ask him for it, right? What are you asking me for help for? Ask him for it. If he sends me on his behalf, awesome. But what do we, we have to adjust, <laughs> we have to adjust our processes, right? That's the problem. We have to adjust our processes to receive the provision. Okay? That's why. That, that, that's a benefit of praying. You have not because you ask not. So if we have stuff, some mountains that need to be moved and some things in our life that we need answers to or whatever, if there's big stuff that we need, who would we go to? Go to the big guy, right? He's got all the resources available to make the situation better. And we have not because we ask not. Go back to James 4.3. Here's another reason to pray. See, not only do we engage God, he says, you, you have not because you ask not. So when we pray to him, we not only engage God into the situation, but it also helps us with this whole evil desires at war within you thing. See, he says in the next verse, sometimes even when you ask me for stuff, you don't get it because your motives are bad. See? So what, this, what, what prayer does is, is when, you, when you ask for stuff from God, if, it's, if you're not getting it, maybe he's trying to teach you something about your own heart. It's not that he's stingy. It's because maybe you're wrong. Maybe you're, you know, I'm just following my heart. Your heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. Stop following your heart. And start following the Lord, right? Your heart is terrible. That's why you need Jesus, right? You, the, you know who causes you the most problems? You, right? Not me, not your spouse, you. You're your biggest problem. So don't follow your heart. Follow the Lord, right? Follow the Lord. And so when you pray, you, you engage God in the situation, but, but also it helps you sort out your own heart. So prayer affects the situation, and it also affects you, the person who's praying. You see that? You see it right there in the text. Yet you don't, bless you, yet you don't have because you don't ask God. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. So it points out areas in your life that need to be helped. That's a benefit of prayer. Here's another prayer, Benny, right? Here's another why. Um, go, go to Philippians 4, 6. Now, this is the part that I mentioned a little bit ago about praying about all things, right? This is the part that we talk about when we do our offerings here at the church and we talk about praying for our offering because we're not supposed to just pray about a bunch of stuff but don't pray about our offering, right? We pray about all things. So let's just see if this is something that I made up or if it's something God's Word clearly is teaching us. Philippians 4, 6. And there's going to be some massive benefits here. He says to pray, right? That's the mandate. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. So the, the, the mandate, the command is to pray about everything. But you say, well, what is that going to, is that going to help me? Is that going to help me? Because if it's not going to help you, radical obedience usually doesn't work. So how is this going to help me? So let's look at it. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. So there's your issue. You've got something on your heart, right? Many of you raised your hand earlier and said that you've got this big thing that you need some help with, right? So when you pray, like, don't just sit there and worry about this thing. Tell God what you need. That's step one. And, and listen, you can't leave these things out and expect the blessing. He's telling you what to do. 
Tell God what you need. Tell him your issue. Tell him your situation. Tell him the fear. Tell him about your anxiety. Tell him about your pressure. Tell him about your bill. Tell him about your health. Tell him about your kids. Tell him about whatever it is that's the mountain in front of you. And then, after you tell him about that, thank him for all that he's done. Now, look what happens. If we will t bring to God my problem and then put that down at the altar and then... Thank him for all that he's done. What happens? Here, here's a promise, not the, not the passionate plea of the preacher, but the promise of prayer from the sovereign king of the universe. If you will bring your problem to me and then take some time to thank me for all that I've done, then you will, someone say you will, you will experience God's peace. Anyone need that? I need that. It's a promise, right? It's a promise. Not from me. That's why we don't make vows. I'll break it. He doesn't. He never breaks his vow. He always delivers on his promise. But listen, you can't get the peace until you bring him the problem. And if you don't bring him the problem and then bring him the, the, the thanksgiving for what he's done, you can't get the peace. So we all want the peace, but we want to circumvent the process. You can't get the peace without the process. Okay? So you bring the problem, you, you tell him all that he's done, and then you receive peace. The prayer... That this prayer that you're offering up to God, it creates peace inside of you, right? That's a benefit for you. The sum total of his past faithfulness in your life will far exceed and outweigh this thing that you are dealing with right now in your life. And so worry is quickly replaced with trust and faith and peace. This is a promise of God. That's part of your Benny package. For prayer. Underutilized tool, guys. Uh, way underutilized tool. Okay, here's another one. <clears throat> if you want to go to Jeremiah 33.3. Just another why. Why should I pray, God? I know you said I'm supposed to pray, but why should I pray? Other than just radical obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commands. But that's not good enough. So tell me why I should pray. And God is so kind and generous that he gives us the wise when he really doesn't have to. I mean, let's be honest, right? If God says, clean up your room, you should just do that, right? But he doesn't. He says, go do that, but let me tell you why you should do that. So Jeremiah 33, 3, here's another why. He says, call to me. I don't know about you. <clears throat> but when you hear the words, call to me, this is not the gospel, by the way. This is just uh, an observation. When you hear the words, call to me, in the context of prayer, would that be vocal? Somewhat? Would it always be super quiet, inward reflection, meditating? Call out to me! Call out to me! When your mom called out to you from the porch when it was time to come home, did she open the door and say, Cindy, come home? What did she do? She hollered, call out to me. And he's your daddy, right? Call out to me. Volume. Call to me, and I will answer you and tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Show of hands. How many people have questions? And they're hidden from you, the answers, and you need to know them. Anybody? Call out to me, and I'll give you answers, right, of great and hidden things you've not yet known. Underutilized tool, a benefit. If you have questions, the promise is there. I'm going to answer you. That's what God says. Well, I asked. Crickets. Anyone? Oh, I asked. Oh, I asked the Lord and there was crickets. Right? We've been showing hands a lot. Let's see that one. I asked and it was just nothing. I heard nothing. Anybody? Come on, be honest. Oh, I have. Hundreds of times, right? <laughs> Hundreds of times. It happens. It's common. Well, but preacher, what do you mean? I mean, it says that if you, ask, if you call out to me, I'll answer you. That's what it says, right? So how is it that it's crickets? Let me ask you a question. 
Call out to me and I'll answer. Did he tell you when he's going to answer you? No. Oh, so maybe there's something there. Uh, Luke 11. You want to go? I want you to see this. I don't want you to just take my word on it. Look, look at Luke, Luke 11. Luke 11, 9 and 10. Jesus Christ, the one we pray to, the one who's got all the answers, the one who made a promise to answer. And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened. For anyone who asks, receives. Anyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Call out to me and I'll answer you and tell you things you've never known. And keep asking me. And keep knocking. And keep calling out to me. See, a lot of people have had prayers in the past that have gone dead. And they didn't hear anything. So when they asked and they didn't hear anything, it went to giving up. And I believe with all my heart that God wants to resurrect some of those dead prayers. He wants to, the Holy Spirit wants to breathe life into some of those old prayers because God's glory is on the line. And he wants to receive some glory for answering those prayers and doing those great things that you asked for and you stopped knocking because you never got an answer. But he said to call out to me and I will give you answers. And if you don't hear it the first time, you keep seeking and you keep knocking and you keep asking and you will hear it. And so I believe that that's what he wants us to do tonight. I would think he wants to resurrect. Jesus is in the resurrection bu business. He wants to resurrect some of those old dreams that you might have had. Some of those old desires. You've been praying for one of your kids. You've been praying for salvation for someone that you love. You've been praying for your business. You've been praying for your marriage. You've been praying for your health. You've been praying for your church. You've been praying for me. Whatever you've been praying for, don't stop praying. Keep knocking and keep asking, and he'll give you your answer. That's a promise of Almighty God. Okay? All right, so look, here's some more. Go back to the book of James, just one chapter. One more chapter, chapter 5. Here's some more why. And then we're going to pray, okay? We're going to pray. We're going to pray like a church is supposed to pray. Here, here's more, James 5, look at verse 13. Are, are any of you suffering hardships? Raise your hand. You suffering hardships? Yeah, we got some people that are suffering something, right? The rest of you are suffering from lying. It's awesome. <laughs> are any of you suffering hardships? Let's try it one more time. Anybody? Else? Yeah, there we go. This so is be honest in church, right? This is part of the enthusiasm part right here. This is the part of the sermon you play in. So uh, what does it say you should do? Go, get, go ask the pastor for some help. Go ask mom. What does it say? Pray. Pray. Who are you supposed to ask? Vertical, vertical, ver right? There it is again. When you, have, when, you have, when you got something going on in your life that's hard, where are you supposed to go? Vertical. You're supposed to pray. You're supposed to ask the Lord, right? You're supposed to ask the Lord. How about this? Are any of you happy? Anybody in here happy? Anyone? Michael's happy. He's super happy, right? Right? Anybody else? Who else is happy? I'm happy, right? So what are you supposed to do? What does it say? Sing praises. What is, what is that? You hear the word pray and praise, don't you? What is, it, what is that? It's just singing prayer. That's it. It's all it is. Sing prayer. That's all you're doing when we're singing these songs. Vertical worship is singing prayer, right? You're singing about him to him. That's vertical. That's right there. That's what it says. If you're happy, if you're happy and you know it, amen, pray. How about this? Are any of you sick? Raise your hand. Sick. Awesome. Great. Sick. You should call for the elders of the church. That's Jay and I right here. Elders of the church. I'm not coming to you to ask you if you want me to pray for you. I'm not. You need to come to me. You need to come to Jay. Why? Because we're jerks? Sometimes. <laughs> but that's not why. What does it say? Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and what? Give you good advice? Pep talk? Pray. Pray over you. Anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Jay has oil in his hand ready for here in a moment. Okay? 
But if you want it, you better come to him. He ain't coming to you. Because we're not going to circumvent God's system. He made a system. If we want the promise of what it says, we have to do with it the process, right? The promise is in the process. Look what it says. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. Do you want that? Then you need to ask him. That's just the way it's, that's what it says, okay? And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. So that's, this is an opportunity tonight to, to confess your sins to, to one of us. We'll do it in private. You don't have to tell us, right? You can do that, and, and you can confess it to the Lord. And 1 John 1, 9, if you, if, you, if you confess your sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's a benefit of prayer, right? Confess your sin to each other and what? Pray for each other. So maybe when we get ready to start praying over here for a little while, maybe some of you need to just get together with some other people, and what does it say? Pray for what? For one another, right? It's not just my job. It's not the pastor's job to just pray. It's your job to pray. You pray for one another. That's what it says right there. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. Uh, The earnest, what? Prayer. Prayer. Earnest. What's earnest mean? Earnest. Fervent passionate get after this thing right that's what our prayer life supposed to be like passionate prayer of the righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results we want that right we want great we want to see great power we want to see god open up the heavens and come down and rock this world and move our mountains and make miracles and heal ourselves all this stuff right you're like <clears throat> yeah well power and all this power praying stuff that's for pastors and people who speak in tongues right i mean that's not just for me we'll look at the text cindy's right but don't believe her believe the bible what's it look what it says right look at this elijah right you let's skip let's 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 just look what it says it, it says that elijah prayed that there be no rain and none fell for three and a half years dude that's pretty powerful right that'd be pretty mac daddy right there you could do that pull that one off that'd be good and then what look then he prayed again. So he prayed one time, and it's, it, hey, it's too much rain. So there's a drought for, for three and a half years. And then after he's done, he's like, okay, we need some rain. So he goes back outside and says, all right, God. I don't even know how he said it, but all right, God, we need some rain. And what does it say? And the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crop. So, so what kind of rain was that? Like it hadn't rained in three years, but it was enough rain to yield crop. It must have been one heck of a rain, right? That's awesome power. That's not me, is it? But look at the first sentence. Look what it says. Elijah was a human as we are. He is no different than anyone sitting in this room right now. Because here's the thing. God loves to use ordinary, wimpy, nothing people so that they don't receive the glory. Right? If you give it to someone awesome, they'll take the glory for themselves. You give it to someone who's incapable or thinks so, and they're just a nothing, God gets glory. Something awesome comes out of me, it's got to be the Lord. Right? You know what I'm saying? If something comes out of you, it's got to be the Lord. None of us are that awesome that we can pull something off. So do you think God wants... Listen, just in that one section right there, from 13 through 18, prayer is mentioned eight times. Eight times! Just in that one little section of the Bible. Imagine how many times it's mentioned during the Bible, but just in this one little section of, what, five verses, eight times. You think God wants us to pray? (laughs) Do you think God wants to do some things? Do you think we're underutilizing this God-given tool called prayer? All of us. And I'm not talking about, some of you are probably like prayer monsters, at home, in your car. I know some of you are like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about my house shall be called a house of prayer. Right? The earnest, fervent, urgent prayer of the righteous has great power and produces wonderful results. And we all need some stuff. You all raise your hand. But listen... The Bible would teach us that you're not righteous, that when Jesus went to the cross and you said yes, he who knew no sin became sin so that you, in him, could become the righteousness of God. 
So if you, if you have Jesus Christ's spirit living inside of you, that's the righteousness that when that thing prays, things get done. And you all have it. You all have it. There's nothing mystical, magical, powerful about me or Jay or Ramon. You all, if you have bent the knee to Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you, and he made you righteous because of that, because of Jesus, not because of you. And so you have the same power available to you that Elijah had. Okay? So, we're going to pray right now. Right here, right now. We're going to pray like a church is supposed to pray. So I want you to turn these lights down in the house. Turn these spots down just a little bit. I don't want you to be thinking about anything. I just want to say this. If you, if you're in this, if you're in this church right now, and you've got some old prayers that you used to pray and and you stopped praying for those things because you asked and you got crickets I want you to listen there's nothing amazing about this but I want you to come forward I want you to come forward I want you to kneel right here right now